So welcome. This is Realising Resilience. I'm Alistair Gray and I'm delighted to be joined by my friend, Michael, Michael Neal. It's great to have you. Hello. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for coming on, Michael. Um, I know you, you know, you kind of responded to an email that I sent you not so long ago. In fact, it was about three days ago. And I reached out to explain, you know, our intention of what we're creating with Realising Resilience, you know, aiming to impact a million lives and to raise over a million pounds for some great causes. So, mm -hmm. like I said, I was very uh, appreciative of your quick response and, you know, real, really honoured to have you on today. Um, oh, very cool. No, I, 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 like, I like things where the answer is yes or no. <laughs> this this <laughs> one was yes. It made it easy for us. And like I said, when you came back, I think uh, from a kind of personal perspective, I was very excited because uh, to give a little bit of context, uh, I met Michael or we met probably about four years ago now. Mm -hmm. And really it was off the back of me diving in deep to your work, pretty much devouring uh, all your books, your TED Talks um, and, uh, you know, any, anything I could get my hand on that was created by Michael Neal, I was in that world. And then we had the fortune of spending some time together at one of your retreats. And, you know, for me, it was truly, truly life changing and impactful. And so when we began creating this campaign, Realizing Resilience, uh, you were, you know, one of the first names that came to, to mind, Michael. So like I said, I'm very grateful that you're showing up today and uh, giving us your wisdom. And, uh, and Well, here's hoping I haven't said anything <laughs> yet. But. I just thought I'd probably put you under a bit of pressure here. Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> but to, to give you know the audience some of the audience will no doubt be familiar with your work Michael but a very brief overview and then you know we'll jump in is that you're an internationally renowned transformative coach and best-selling author of six books six believe, books uh, which yeah. is amazing uh, creating the impossible the inside out revolution and the space within three of those uh, you're often described as a coach's coach and you've got a huge amount of respect within you know, our field of coaching for unleashing human potential and in a way that is intelligent, uh, you know, full of humor and full of heart, which is, you know, just amazing. I mentioned your TED Talks. There's two of them. I would recommend everyone who watches this interview to check them out. Uh, the first was Why Aren't We Awesomer, uh, which is just amazing. It's one of the, the first pieces of content that I consumed by you, Michael. And I remember it just changing something quite significantly in the way I see the world. Uh, and your most recent was, can a TEDx really change the world? So like I said, go and check them out uh, once you've watched this interview. Um, so yeah, I'd love to jump in, Michael. Obviously the theme is around resilience and I thought it'd be a good place to start would be, you know, really asking you what resilience means, you know, your own definition of resilience, because I think there is a, a little bit of uncertainty around what the word actually means. And when mm. we began researching resilience, we noticed that, you know, the Google search results on that word have increased significantly in the last few weeks alone uh, due to the, you know, the, the current situation we find ourselves in. And so I'd, I'd love to hear, you know, what your definition of resilience is or your understanding of it. Well, it's changed over the years because I, I, I think I started out with this, the conventional idea of resilience, which is you know, our ability to bounce back from uh, problems, from bad situations, from traumas, from things like that, you know, uh, uh, battered but not broken, uh, sadder but wiser. And, and I never loved it because <laughs> it just, it was like, I don't know if I want to be sadder but wiser, you know? Can I just be happy and dumb? And, 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 and so it was... You know, and there are all sorts of lovely metaphors about, you know, you, you can push something underwater, but then it'll always rise back to the surface. And, and I, I don't discount any of that. That, that. that is our nature. But for me, what makes us resilient is our ability to start from scratch anytime, in any moment, to, to literally have a fresh start every day if we want, every hour if we want. Not, oh, I gotta start again, but that capacity to, to, to begin each day from a blank page instead of as the next page in an ongoing novel of suffering and despair and trauma and 
problems. Now, of course we have those too. But if I'm carrying 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50, I mean, keep going. How many years of past problems and I'm, oh, I'm still, I'm resilient. I can carry this load. That's very different than knowing that I can live today free from that. I can start today without my backpack of rocks. And that capacity to me is our innate resilience. The ability to start from scratch. The ability to start from scratch, to get a, a fresh start in any moment, to, um, to literally begin each, each, each day, each moment as good as new. Mm. You know, because that's the other thing is, is, is that battered but bruised, sadder but wiser. It's like, no, no, actually, I, I sometimes use the metaphor of a mirror. That a mirror could be reflecting horror, horrific things for years and years and years. The mirror is untouched. It's as good as new. And if the next thing that comes in front of the mirror is beautiful, the mirror will reflect beauty. Doesn't matter if it's been 50 years reflecting something else. And that's just built into the nature of a mirror. Well, we're like that. We're, we're, we're sort of, as best I understand, pure consciousness in form. And so it, 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 it you know, I'll, another metaphor I'll use is, is people think of themselves as the person on the ground getting either rained on or the sun is shining. And you, you, you hope for more sunshiny days than rainy days in your life. But it seems to me that we're the sky. Like we are the, the place within which weather happens. And, and so, yeah, there'll be rainy days. And I don't think the sky minds that there are rainy days because the sky is still the sky. I, I don't think it minds that if, it, if there are a lot of clouds on some days, and we all have cloudy days right? Rainy days and Mondays, right? But it, it, the sky doesn't mind, the sky, because the sky's still the sky. The sun's still there. It's just sometimes, yeah, we, we don't see it for a little while, but we know it's there. You know, there has never been a police report filed for a missing sun in that mm -hmm. sense. So in the same way, if we start to get our innate spark, our innate intelligence, our responsiveness, our creativity, our sense of fun, our sense of play, they never go anywhere. They're like the sun. Sometimes they're in evidence, sometimes they're not, but they're powering the system the whole time. Yeah, amazing. Hmm. It reminds me when, when we first uh, met Michael, because you know this innate nature, this essence of who we are, and even the concept that, you know, that is, is, always there like the sky like you said but the the weather or the storms or whatever comes through us is exactly that it's something that, that can pass and I, mm. I remember when you and I first met you said something that stuck with me and I, I'm not sure if I've shared this with you but it was something that really opened up my mind because you said Alistair you said you're very intuitive and you know, you, 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 you're able to feel your way through this world and I'm paraphrasing <laughs> but it was along those lines. And, but what I'm not paraphrasing is the words you said were, but here's the thing, you think the magic exists outside of you. And I'd love to help show you that the magic is inside of you. And it was that thought that the magic in that innate nature that, that is unchangeable or untouchable really, really evoked something quite powerful in me that day. I don't know if you remember saying that, Michael. I don't, but I'm glad. I'm glad it went well. But it's true, is the other thing. I mean, you know, the, you know it's not so much, oh, what a nice belief system. It, 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 it's as best I can tell, it is the truth of human beings. We are, we are born happy. We're born okay. And, and yes, stuff will happen. Um, Sid Banks, who is sort of my mentor person who, who kind of opened my eyes to the way that the world looks to me now, he, he, he's a nice Scotsman. Um, you, know, he, you, you know, he said, life is a contact sport. You're going to get your knocks. It, it, it's not, nobody's suggesting that it isn't. 
but that's okay because you don't have to wear the scars like you really do it's not like in the physical where yeah if you get hit it, it might do some damage mentally emotionally spiritually we we literally are are as as capable of joy and peace and 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 happiness as we were when we were little little children i mean that 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 doesn't leave us but yeah it can get snowed under <laughs> you know we can lose sight of it you know no doubt about that um and it's and it's even that is okay like like i say i don't think the sky mines when it rains you know i think people get they start judging their their responsiveness to things like pandemics. Like how the hell do any of us know how one is supposed to respond to a pandemic? When's the last one you were in? Me neither, right? So I like, I don't know, maybe that's the right amount of angry and the right amount of sad and the right amount of worried and the right, but, but underneath it all, you're as good as new. It's just like before the pandemic. It's, you, you know, what, what, the aliveness in you doesn't go anywhere until it does. And it's not, I, I don't think the aliveness actually goes anywhere. I think we do at some point, but, but, but so that knowledge to me has, has just made the unknown much more exciting than worrying much more. There's a, there's a beautiful story. I, I, I don't know if I told this on the retreat or, but of a, of, of a man named Ishii. He's an, uh, a Native American who came out of the, the mountains in Northern California in 1911. And he, he became kind of studied because that's what they did back then. They would you know, study the strange phenomenon and take them on lecture tours. Look at my, look at my Native American. And, and, uh, and on the very first time that he went on one of these lecture tours, uh, the professor who, who became friends with him Notice that he hid behind a, 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 a pole at the, tra at the train station when the train came in and he was, looked terrified. And he didn't know what was going on, but he kind of waved him on the train and Ishii came and he got on the train and, and the, afterwards the professor asked him, what, what was that all about? And Ishii said, well, my people lived in the mountains and we used to see the, the iron dragon come through the valley and swallow up all the, all the, all the people uh at, 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 at when it would stop and that's the first time i had been that close to one of the dragons and the professor was blown away and he said but if you thought that was an iron dragon and it was going to eat us why did you come on the train and he said in my life i've learned to be more curious than afraid and it, see i love that because it it's not saying you're not supposed to be afraid but if you're more curious than afraid, it doesn't matter so much because it's not going to stop you. It's not going to be a, I can't do anything because I'm scared. It's like, yeah, sometimes I'm scared. And I wonder what's going to happen tomorrow. I wonder what's going to happen next month. I wonder what's going to become possible that wasn't possible before. I wonder what's going to occur to me that's never occurred to before. I, I wonder what's going to come through me that's never come through me before. You, you guys, right? Three weeks ago? This didn't exist. You know, now you're in the midst of creating something that's going to raise millions of, of dollars or pounds and help millions of people. It's like, that's kind of cool. But if I told you about it three months ago, that wasn't part of your plans. See, that's the excitement. The unknown is a place of pure possibility. But we make up, we know what's going to happen and it's not going to be good. And we're making it up. And it doesn't help us to make it up. Yeah, that is all. <laughs> I, I love that. You know, when you, especially, you know, when you tell the story, it's a, the, the perception, it's the thought, right, about the the, the train that, that appears to be something different. And and you also said, you know, you recognise that people can get snowed under, you know, hmm. with with. Uh, the experience that they find themselves in, we can get caught up in the content of our experience. So from your own experience, Michael, you know, working with so many different people and, and having been through no doubt adversities in life yourself, how can we remind ourselves 
of this, you know, this innate nature? How can we remind ourselves to reset when things can appear or seem to be, you know, exceptionally challenging? Well, I think it really is just a noticing game. That if you are willing to pay a little bit of attention to your own experience, you'll start to notice that when you're not overthinking everything, there's a well-being in us. There's a, an energy in us. There's an aliveness in us. There is a freshness. There is humor. There is uh, presence. And so if we start to notice that presence is the default, and, and I say the default because it's what we go back to when we stop worrying about everything, then that does something for you because you start to see, oh, okay, my nature is what I'm looking for. Then you'll start to notice yourself if you keep paying attention, thinking your way out of it again and again and again and again and again, worrying yourself, discouraging yourself, terrifying yourself, and then coming back to yourself. And once you see the game for what it is, it's less scary because it's all happening inside you. And, and uh, you know, they, they say that uh, we can't tickle ourselves, like, like you, 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 that's, and we can't scare ourselves if we recognize our voice. So like if you do a scary voice, right? Like you'll, you will always know that it's you at some level and you can't scare yourself if you know it's you. You can't tickle yourself if, if, if you know it's you. Well, when you start to see that you are the one scaring yourself with scary thinking, that you are the one taking yourself away from this presence with worry about the future, with, um, God, I don't even know what the word would be for what we do to ourselves with the past, but just piling on. I mean, we are not kind to ourselves at all. And, uh, you know, a friend of mine um, was a, a psychologist for years, worked with one of the big hospitals here in America. It was the, and and he, he told me about this one patient he had who was in her 80s, and he said she was the most miserable woman he had ever met in his life. And, and, and you know, he, 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 it takes a lot to make this guy <laughs> say something like that. And, and he said at one point, he just despaired of getting her to see any hope, any sense of possibility, anything good. And he said to her, I'm going to make up her name, but he, he said, Doris, are you ever not miserable? And she said, oh, yeah. He was like, when? <laughs> and, 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 and she said, well, every morning when I wake up. And then I start thinking about, you know, all the things I've been through and all the things I'm going to have to do. And by the time my feet hit the floor, and it's like, and she heard herself. She noticed, oh, I'm doing that. Not in a shame, bad, fault way. In an absolutely innocent, normal, but not terribly helpful way. We have a lot of not terribly helpful habits of thought. And if we start to notice them even a little, we also notice the space between thoughts, the space before thought. That's our nature. That's where resilience is because that is unaffected by anything that's happened, anything that has come through it, like the mirror, like the sky. No sadder but wiser, no, no battered but, I can't remember what that expression is right now, but, you know, just as good as new a fresh start. Yeah, I love that. There's this, this, um, the sense of just this unpolluted awareness. Yeah. Yeah. I sometimes use a Sid, a Sid Banks quote where he said, um, you know, who we are is pure consciousness uncontaminated by our personal thinking, mm. which doesn't mean you're not going to have thinking or you shouldn't think or thinking is bad. Of course you're going to think, a lot of thinking is really helpful, but a lot of it isn't. And, and I rarely meet people who think too little. 
contrary to popular opinion. I meet a lot of people who think too much. <laughs> I'm kind of sitting here laughing at myself as well, Michael, because I was thinking too much this morning when I woke up thinking, I've got to interview Michael Neal today. <laughs> oh, dear God, man, I, I feel for you. <laughs> but you know, you get lost in thought. And then I started thinking about all of the other things in the day. And I could feel the, the overwhelm come up. And I was able to snap out of it simply because I noticed my thinking. You know, I noticed, I began noticing what I noticed. And then I had a giggle because I thought, I'm going to be speaking to Michael, who's going to remind me of all of this anyway. <laughs> but that's the beauty is we get reminded of it throughout the day. Once you, ca once you get eyes for it, you'll see it everywhere. That's, that's, that's the, the, the fun of it. It's, you know, the, the, the kind of classic metaphor is how would you explain water to a fish? Well, you can't, well, partly because I don't think fish get much, but, 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 you know, that's, we live in this. We were born into this thought thing and, and life thing. And so we, we tend not to notice it because it's always been a part of our world. But that's, but, but once you start noticing it, you'll see it all, you'll see it everywhere. I, I, I remember driving down the street. It, actually, I was in the back of a cab in London years ago. And I'd been reading a lot about this idea that everybody is living in their own separate thought-created reality. And they just think that we're all, we, we think we're all in the same reality, which is why we don't understand how some people can behave the way they behave. Yet in their reality, it makes perfect sense. It just makes no sense in ours. And I thought it was a neat idea. Like I, 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 I thought, oh, okay, cool. But that day, I, I remember we were driving and it was a quiet morning and I was just in a kind of nice place. I, I, I looked and there was a woman coming out of a council house trying to get a stroller set up for her baby. And I could see she wasn't there. Like she was, she was in her head. But she was still going through the motions. I mean, it, was, it wasn't unsafe. And then I, as, as we drove, I just saw everybody, if not on their phones, on a phone in their head, like checking out anything. And, and every now and again, you'd see somebody who seemed to actually be where they were. Now, again, it's not, yes, must be more mindful. It's just once you start to see that's how we live, a lot of life makes more sense. And then you get to make some different choices if you want to. Because honestly, it's almost not a choice once you notice it. It's like, uh, you, you know, I'll sometimes describe it as um, if, if I've got a, 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 a pain in my leg and I suddenly notice that I am repeatedly stabbing myself in the leg with a fork, I don't need therapy, <laughs> you might argue. I don't need, I don't need, uh, you know, years of practice to undo the habit, the second I see that, oh, good Lord, what am I doing? It's done. I'm, I'm not going to do it again until the next time. And then as soon as I notice it again, I'm not going to do it anymore. We are so much more adaptable than we have been told we are. There's all this research about it. it takes 30 days to change a habit, 45 days to change a habit, 60 days to change a habit. Bullshit. It takes one insight. I've worked with so many people who dealt with addiction who just talk about a discrete moment where they suddenly got, oh shit, this is rat poison. This is not good for me. This is genuinely killing me. Done. Yes, it took support. It took time. But the moment of insight was when it changed. I, an analogy I've used for years because it's so obvious to most people is if you go to work the same way, you've gone to work the same way every day for 30 years, and somebody shows you a shortcut that gets you there in half the time and it's much prettier, do you need a 30-day reprogramming period before you start going to work the new way? No. It's immediate. And sure, you might st get distracted one day, be in your head and start out the old way, and then you'll remember and you go, oh, well. Because you know you'll take the, the better way the next time. That's us. We are one thought away, one insight away, one notice away 
from behaving completely differently, from experiencing differently. And to me, that's why it's hard for me to get too worked up about anyone's problems, including my own. Because I know that, like one of, the, one, of the, one of the actual big moments for me where I really saw this was I had a friend and her husband had a heart attack. And, you know, their, their health insurance here in America, you know, it was very much dependent on the husband's job. And they had a kid, they have a kid who had some serious health problems from birth. And, you know, she was sad. She was scared. She was upset. She asked if, if we could get together for lunch. And I said, absolutely. And, and this was in the evening, so it was going to be the next day. Well, between that phone call and lunch, a bunch of stuff went wrong in my business. Like I just had a, a bunch of fires to put out. And I was, I, I was really worked up and in my head. And, uh, you know, the rain was pounding on me. And, and I, I, I was going to cancel. But you know that other voice in your head, the quiet one, the one that kind of goes, it's, it's all right. You're fine. Just right. That voice <laughs> was like, just go, just be with her. You don't have to be great. Just be, mm -hmm. right. I can do that. So I went to lunch and, and she poured her heart out to me for 45 minutes to an hour, you know, all her fears, all her worries. And then totally not professional coach, uh, you know, Michael, I just dumped on her for half an hour about all the shit I was dealing with. And, and, and it was, so, so we got to the end, like we were both spent. <laughs> and, and I, I had a, a thought and I said to her, you know, the only difference between you and me right now is you think this is still going to look as bad tomorrow. And I know it could look like anything tomorrow. And it was funny, she reached out to me that evening and it had already changed for her. Mm -hmm. She was already seeing it different. She was seeing possibility. Yes, her husband still had had a heart attack. Yes, there was still all sorts of stuff that had to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. But she was no longer stuck in a made up reality where he was dead and they were losing their health insurance and they were gonna be on the street and their child was gonna die. And like she realized, oh God, I'm making all of that up and I'm scaring the hell out of myself. And Honestly, scaring the hell out of yourself while you're trying to deal with something real, not a great strategy. Mm. Doesn't help. And yet it's just a habit that most of us have. Um, but we don't need to be a victim of it. You know, we are one fresh thought, one insight, one noticing away from a, a whole different experience. Yeah. That's resilience. That's the possibility. And, and, you know, it, it's, it is amazing. I remember reading a quote by Rupert Spira that said, you know, all of our suffering is contained within a single thought mm. or contained within one thought. I've never heard that, but I like that. Yeah. And, and, and it was a powerful concept. And I think where that can seem so obvious, and even, you know, when you talk, Michael, I love, you know, how eloquent you are in explaining things through analogies and stories and it. It can feel so simple, right? Be present, you know, be in the moment and, and you know, allow the, the personal thinking mind to settle down. A new, new thought, new, more supportive thought will likely come to the surface. But that, even how simple it can appear, and it is, it can also seem very challenging if, for instance, you are caught up in those moments of, no challenge or adversity or you know we talked about touched upon grief or homelessness and all of these other challenges so in those moments when it can be overwhelming and the you know the the tendency of our thinking patterns is more negative is is you know thinking about all of the things that could go wrong and maybe going wrong how in those moments can can we connect to this innate nature and that's a pretty big question i realize that well but it's a good question because it's a question that a lot of people have and i think the the key to the answer is in recognizing the difference between learning through understanding insight seeing and learning through information and concept and practice so if, if you really get how something works, you will work with it as well as it can be worked with. 
If you understand the physics, you can do any kind of engineering. If you fundamentally misunderstand how something works, you can try and force yourself to do things the way that it looks like it works, but they don't have the same effect. There's a famous uh, talk given by the physicist Richard Feynman, and he talked about the South Sea Islands cargo cults. And this was apparently a real thing after World War II. There were all these islands in the South Pacific that had briefly hosted um, American or Japanese um, armies. And the armies tended to actually be pretty generous with the, the, the natives because it was in their best interest to be. And so they would fly in and they would um, build runways and they would, they would leave food and, and, and clothes and all sorts of things and then fly off. And of course, to the natives, they just thought the gods were descending from the sky in giant birds and giving them beneficence. And, and so for years after the, the armies had left, they would stand and, and it was very ritualized and they would stand on the dirt runways with sticks doing what they saw the people doing and coconuts on their ears like the headphones and doing everything that they saw to call forth the, the god birds from the sky. Now, that actually makes total sense. We can look at it and we can go oh, roll our eyes, but given what they, their misunderstanding of what was happening, that was a really clever response. Mm. Well, when we misunderstand where our experience comes from, where our sense of worry and panic comes from, where our well-being and creativity come from, we'll do a lot of stuff that doesn't work, but kind of looks like it does sometimes. So back to your, your, your question, how do, you, how do you do that? If the secret is just be present and don't get too caught up in your thinking, you know, how do I do that? Well, if you see that the present moment is like a magic carpet, it will take you places. It is not a stagnant, still thing. You don't have to, okay, I'm present, now what? It actually is, a, it's the most alive we ever are is when we are fully in whatever we're in. It's why athletes love athleting. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's why musicians love musicking. It's why all of us love being so absorbed in something that we lose all sense of time and self. Well, that's portable. You can do that anywhere, anytime, if you understand that's what that is. But if you don't understand, then, okay, how do I create this? I need to do this, and I need to practice this. That's hard, and I honestly, I don't know anybody, that's not quite true, but I don't know many people who can pull it off for any length of time to make themselves present, to make themselves mindful, to make themselves not get caught up in their thinking. But if you get it, so here, this might, this might be the simpler example. I was giving a talk once and I was talking about this and, and I talked about, I, I shared that sky and rain analogy. And, and somebody in the audience was very upset with me because they were obviously very in their head and something, they might've, they might've had horrible life circumstances. I have no idea. But they, they, they were essentially almost shouting at me. Like, so you're saying that, 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 that you know, even though all this stuff is happening, I'm still okay. So what, so what about you? What happens to you when you, you know, what if you went out in the rain and you didn't have an umbrella and you didn't, and, and, and I just said to them, look, if I went out in the rain, I'd get wet, but it would be okay. Cause I know I'd dry out. Cause that's how we're made. I know I'd warm back up because that fire is inside us. So in the same way, I don't necessarily love being wet, soaked through, chilled to the bone, but I know that I'll come back online. That's how we're made. I don't have to even do anything in order to do it. And so while it's still uncomfortable in the moment, it's not uncomfortable in the moment and miserable because of me projecting the moment into the future and assuming if I'm this wet now, imagine how wet I'm going to be when the, by the time the quarantine's over, right? If it's this bad now, imagine how bad it's going to be. Well, yeah, that's a great way to make yourself miserable. Imagine how bad it's going to be by projecting the present into the future. It's not true. 
It's total make-believe, but it is within our capacity to do it if we don't understand that we're the ones doing it, right? So understanding, seeing something insightfully, that's why I'll come back to noticing. Just paying a little bit more attention than you usually do to what's going on inside you. And you'll start to see, because it's how we work, it's how we're made, and we are beautifully made. We are made for resilience. We are made for fresh starts. We are made to be as good as new. And that's kind of cool and comforting when you know it, when you see it for yourself. It's really, really comforting. Yeah, that's beautiful. I think um, as you were talking there, it's, you know, the knowing that you mentioned, it's, it's trusting and knowing that that's in there. And, and we, I ran another interview yesterday and we were talking about the concept of hope. And as you gave that the analogy around, you know, being wet in the moment, it may feel uncomfortable and it may feel difficult. And, you know, like I said earlier, there are many people going through this uncomfortableness and, and, and pain. But if we have a, a knowing that this resilience that, that we talk about is innate, it's always there. And it's, and it's something that, that we are completely, it's part of us, right? It's, it, it makes up who we are. Then for me, and again, I'd love to know your thoughts on it, Michael, it kind of gives a hope. It, mm. it kind of fills my heart with hope, but also allows me to trust that, that I, I am okay and I will be okay. So there's an old analogy for resilience that I always liked. I think it's a guy named Matthew McFarland, but I may have just made up the name. Um, and, and, <laughs> and he talked about um, how people tend to see themselves as Christmas ornaments, oranges, or rubber balls. And if you think of yourself as a Christmas ornament, then essentially you, you're, you, you may look great on the outside, but you're pretty fragile and it wouldn't take much of a drop to break you. If, you're, if you think of yourself as an orange, well, you're pretty tough. You got a thick skin. You can take a lot. And it won't show on the outside how damaged you are on the inside. But if you keep throwing oranges against walls, the insides start to rot and go off. And eventually, you'll see it from the outside. But a rubber ball is made to bounce. Now, you can talk about it as an attitude, but to me, it's just what's true. We are made to bounce. So given that, I am pretty hopeful every time I bump into something that I'm going to bounce off it because I'm made of rubber. I mean, you know, it's, it's a metaphor. But, 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 but I think that there is something incredibly hopeful about the truth. Like, like no, nobody's in control of the universe. Nobody can make this all wave a, ma wave a hand and make it all magic away. Nobody can bring back a loved one if we've lost a loved one. And yet, with love in our heart for those that we lose, for compassion for those that are suffering, we're, we're made of light. We're, we're made of literal stardust. I mean, it, it, it's all of these things that have become cliches are actually just true. And if you notice it, oh, it's hopeful. Because you know, wow, not only am I going to be okay, but I don't have to be the one to make myself okay. It's built in. The rubber ball doesn't have to set its legs so that it can jump when it hits bottom. It's made to do that. We are made for this. We literally are made for this. Our our spiritual architecture is extraordinary. And when we see that, yeah, we're hopeful. And when we forget it, well, all bets are off. But only until we remember again. <laughs> That's amazing, Michael. And I'm, I'm conscious of our time because it's been, um, you know, the, like I said, every time I spend, you know, in your company, uh, an amount of time you remind me of the simplicity but you remind me of this truth that that resides within and and i think that that truth you know at the moment is easy to forget for many and yeah. 
you know, you've got a great way of reminding people, including myself, that this truth and this ability to bounce back using that or, or bounce like the rubber ball is innate. It's with us all the time. So I am conscious of time. And I, you know, I wanted to say, first of all, thank you, Michael, for coming on here today. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and, and you know, the concepts of resilience. And you know, I have no doubt that many people are going to want to find more of, of your work. So I'd love to ask you, you know, what, what have you got going on at the moment and where can people connect to you know, more, of, um, more of your work? And, and, you know, the... Well, dep depending on when they're watching. So michaelneal.org is my, my home on the web. And I, I've had for years a membership. And for the time being, as this has been all going on, we've opened it up to everyone. So instead of having to pay, and there's a ton of resources, there's calls with me, there's, and that's, you know, that's just sort of our way of saying, hey, just, you know, I love the Ram Das quote, we're all just walking each other home. Yeah. Come, come on, we'll walk together. We'll go through this together. So that michaelneal.org and join the inner circle is, is the easy way. And then um, Dr. Robert Holden and I are starting a new program called uh, the Spiritual Resilience Mastermind. And you can learn about that at spiritualresilience.club, which I didn't even know was a thing, dot club, but it is spiritualresilience.club. <laughs> um, but, but, but that's, that for me is, uh, you know, I've seen so much generosity. I mean, what you guys are doing, I've seen so much creativity come out of this. And it reminds me of most things. I, I, I talk to a lot of people who've recovered from cancer or uh, a, you know, other life-threatening situations and illnesses. And, and one of the things that they often say, and this was true of me and, and depression, which I won't get into, but watch Why Aren't We Awesomer? And it's all in there. Um, but the, the general feeling is it's not a gift because you wouldn't give it to somebody you loved if you had any say in the matter. But boy, are there gifts in it. And, and the phrase I remember using all the time, and I've heard from echoed by so many survivors of whatever they've survived, is best thing that ever happened to me wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. And so, no, we don't have to go looking for trouble. Trouble will find us. But, but actually, a lot of good can come from it if we let it. What a beautiful note to end on. And I'm sure there are going to be many gifts realized, you know, maybe not in the moment, but upon reflection, once we come through this experience on a collective level. And, um, and one of those gifts right now, Michael, is you giving us your time. So um, I'd like to say thank you for coming on Realizing Resilience. Uh, this will be going live in the coming days. <laughs> so yeah. We'll keep everyone aware. But also, Michael, I know you've offered to record a short video where you'll share some additional thoughts uh, for yeah. the community as well. So we'll make sure that that goes live. And if this has benefited you, if you feel like there are others in your life who would benefit from hearing, uh, you know, some of these messages and thoughts that we've shared today, then please share. Um, and we look forward again to taking this campaign, hopefully to as many people as we can reach online. Uh, so Michael, I'm looking forward to connecting again sometime soon, but thank you so much. Nice, for to, no, nice to see you. Thank you for doing this and love to the, love to the wife and kid. <laughs> yeah, likewise. Send my love to Nina and the family and we'll connect right. again very soon. Okay. All right. Take care, my friend. Take care. Bye-bye.